welcome to lecture 7. Uh, so, let me just briefly recapitulate what I said last time. Uh, f the firstly, as I said, uh, we are interested in defining the semantics of programming languages in somewhat the same way as we have rigorously defined syntax. And uh, uh, while defining a semantics of a programming language, what we should keep in mind is uh, uh, firstly that a programming language is capable of an existence that is independent of any machine. Very much like natural languages do not have any implementation, but they exist as objects of our thought, of our conception. Similarly, there is no reason why programming languages cannot be thought of as objects of our conception of our thought uh, independent of any particular implementation. So, so, when, so while defining the semantics of a programming language, one thing that must be kept in mind is that it is a mathematical object in itself, interesting enough to study for its own sake if you like. Secondly, what reinforces this view is also that if indeed programming languages have to be implemented, then what we would like to do is to implement them or to specify their meanings in a, in a fashion that is independent of any particular machine or architecture. And the fact that you have to be you have to make it independent of any particular machine or architecture itself gives it a standing that is abstracted away from actual implementations and it gives it an independent existence right so what we will do is uh, and uh, as far as uh, certain things are concerned uh, as far as programming languages are concerned in recent times we have what are known as specification languages Okay, which are very much like programming languages except that they are not implementable. They are an excellent means of conveying ideas either about programs or about implementations, but they really exist completely independently and do not have any implementation. In fact, uh, s some simple specification languages that have, that have been used in the past are languages like logic itself they could be used as specification languages. They have a particular syntax, they have a certain grammar, but they do not necessarily have a complete implementation. Certain subsets of them could be implemented of course. One of the reasons for having a, so, uh, uh, so specification languages for example would include some implementable concepts and also others which are meant to convey abstract ideas in a precise and uh, unambiguous form without necessarily having an implementation. Yeah? So, we will, we will look at the basic syntactic classes of programming languages from a semantic viewpoint. So, what from a semantic viewpoint consist, uh, uh, or constitute the basic syntactic classes that we should study in programming languages? Previously, the syntactic classes we studied were the non-terminals, the formation of terms and so on they, and they had a purely syntactic existence which, which was really devoid of any meaning that we might associate with them. But now we would like to classify the various kinds of constructs into some broad syntactic categories which are influenced by what we expect their meaning to be. Yeah. So, and basic to this viewpoint is the notion of program equivalence which we already seen. Firstly, as I said, two programs are this uh, a view of equivalence which says that all the step by step state changes should be the same in, in order to 
deem two programs to be equivalent <coughs> is really too fine a criterion which we do not want. Secondly, whether if uh, saying that two programs are equivalent if the algorithms they represent are the same or are equivalent is also too coarse a way of looking at programs. Because what we would like to do is to be able to reason about programs in terms of the underlying syntactic structure and every algorithm has an infinite number of implementations. which. So, what we would like to know is something s slightly finer than just, an equ just the equivalence of algorithms or just the equivalence of functions. If we can do something finer than that, we would be able to abstract away from that and get our final results, namely the equivalence of functions or equivalence of algorithms. Yeah? So, <coughs> so, what we would like to do is in order to be able to use the syntax of a programming language, in order to be able to derive its meaning, we will define certain syntactic categories uh, from the viewpoint of semantics and uh, from the viewpoint of what kinds of functions we expect them to mean. Right? So, the basic question is what are this, what kinds of, if you look at an arbitrary programming language, what kinds of syntactic classes do you find which seem to be completely different in meaning, I mean which have differences, uh, which, which are, which, which have completely different kinds of meaning, right. So, we would, we look at each programming language construct as a notation for something. So, the question is what does it denote, what does it produce or what does it achieve with respect to some notion of a computation state, some notion of the state of a computation. So, what we would like to see is what are the various kinds of meanings that we might associate with programming language constructs which, which are very, very different. Okay, the kinds of meaning is what we are interested. First, first we should get to know about the kinds of meaning, and then maybe we can actually worry about the meanings themselves. Yeah. So we might look at, in general, for most programming languages, we could look at the computational state. So this, the notion of a computational state is something that I have used, but I have never actually specified. So let me first partition the computational state into two kinds of objects. So, one is what is known as an environment. Okay. So, an environment is a loosely speaking a record of identifier bindings and identifier bindings means that an environment clearly specifies what names are being used for what kinds of objects for what objects in a localized fashion. So, and a binding is some localized association. Okay. So, then you might have name value bindings or you might have name location bindings uh, by location maybe memory location bindings. So, we will just look upon an environment as essentially specifying what kinds of, what, what are the different names that are being used in this program and what is this, what are the bindings associated with these names. So, if the various kinds of identifiers in a programming language, I mean they, they could be several, they could be constant identifiers, they could be variable identifiers, they could be type identifiers, they could be procedure identifiers, function identifiers. And the same identifiers could be used in different uh, scopes with different uh, bindings. So, that is what makes the binding a localized association. You could use the same identifier let us say i as a global variable of a program 
and as the name of a function in some deep inner scope. Okay. So, the name i, there is only one name i, but it has different bindings at different stages of the program. It has different localized associations. While you are within that some deep inner scope, I would denote let us say the, the procedure called I, which is available in that scope. While you are in the outermost level of the program, I would denote the variable that was declared globally. Okay. So, the notion of what does I denote is important and that is a binding. So, names themselves are associated with bindings and till you know what names are being used for what purposes, you really cannot talk about the meaning of a program. And this is actually an age old practice even in mathematics. You take any, you take any problem, uh, you are supposed to, well uh, given that 10 apples cost 20 rupees, you have to find out how much 15 apples cost. So, the first thing you do is let x be the cost of 15 apples and there you are specifying a name x with a binding that it is the price of 15 apples. You might use another name, let a be the cost of one apple that there again you are specifying a name binding, a name value binding, right. So, an environment is just a collection of names along with their bindings in the environment. And, ne and uh, then the next component of a computational state is the store. Loosely speaking, in most, uh, in most languages, uh, in most imperative languages at least, the store is just a map of the memory, if you like. Yeah? So, it is just the record of various state changes that have taken place. It may not be a complete history of the state changes, but it might be the, it might be the result of all the latest updates. The, so, so, this store really gives you um, various kinds of location value bindings. Right. We will we will look at that in greater detail later. But essentially, we can look upon a computational state as consisting of as uh, two parts: an environment and a store. Okay, and with this as the basic notion of a computational state, uh, certain programming languages may not have the notion of a store at all, and that's what distinguishes. I mean that's that's what distinguishes functional programming languages from imperative programming languages. Okay, there is no concept of a store in functional programming languages. Right? Okay. So, however, we would like to talk about all these uh, things in a uniform fashion. So it's necessary for us to take the full generality of a computational state into account whenever. Uh, we talk about the subject of programming languages. So, the, if you look at any programming language, let us say an imperative programming language, since they are the hardest to specify and they are the also the most complex, we might the various we might classify the various syntactical constructs in the programming languages in the programming language into three broad classes. One is the class of expressions that the, pro that, the, that the language allows, a class of commands and a class of declarations. And these three syntactic classes actually they do not overlap, but you can use one syntactic class to define another. Okay. So, uh, and the reason for and if you look at what 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 do expressions denote what do commands denote and what do declarations denote you will see that i mean there is really nothing else to programming languages these are the only three things that you should really worry about 
when defining a semantics. Yeah? So, so let us look at expressions. When we talk of expressions, every expression as far as we are concerned has, has essentially uh, the meaning of an expression is just some value. There are other, other, there are constraints of course, like the expression should have a value of the type mentioned as the type of the expression. The type of an, a complicated expression should be derivable from the types of the individual components of that expression and so on. But essentially, if you look at an expression, then any expression denotes a value. The whole idea of an expression is that it is something that has to be evaluated to eventually obtain a value. Okay? This, the notion of this value is different from the notion of a memory location. For pragmatic reasons, you might actually use a memory location in order to store the value, but that memory location is not part of the language specification of the language. That is a pragmatic aspect which has to do with the architecture or the machine or a particular implementation of the language. There is absolutely no reason why we should confuse let us say values from uh, values stored in memory locations. Okay? The two are logically distinct as we will see. Yeah? <coughs> so, uh, so, one thing is that in any particular environment and store, you might have two expressions which denote the same value in that particular environment and store but they may not be equivalent. Yeah? So, when we talk of expressions, so the question is, so, so, uh, remember that we are eventually also interested in what constitutes program equivalence and since expressions form an integral part of any program, we should, we should first get to know and we are supposed to abstract out <coughs> program equivalence from the equivalence of the individual components of the program, the first question that arises is what constitutes expression equivalence? When would you say two expressions are equivalent? Okay. So, in a particular computation state, two distinct expressions that means which have distinct uh, abstract or concrete syntax trees might actually give you the same value, but that does not mean that the two expressions mean the same thing. The two expressions have a meaning which goes far beyond any particular computation state. So, if two expressions yield the same value in a given computation state, that means in a given environment with a given store, then all that means is that in that particular, at that particular point in the program, one of the expressions could be replaced by the other, but that does not necessarily mean that the two expressions mean the same thing. Okay? So, when would, when would you say two expressions mean the same thing? Well, when under all states of computation, the two expressions yield identical values. Yeah? So, regardless of what might be the computation state, if the two expressions yield identical values, then we could say that the two expressions are semantically equivalent. Okay? And actually, it turns out that what we are talking about, so what we mean by semantical equivalence is really what constitutes equality in a broad mathematical area in which that expression resides. Okay. So, a simple example is that of let us say these two Boolean expressions. Right? So, there is this standard, uh, standard de Morgan's law in Boolean algebra which tells you that these two expressions have the same value. Okay? So, they are logically equivalent. That means, it does not matter in what context these two expressions appear, but in the larger framework of Boolean algebra, 
these two expressions are the same. So, they are syntactically different. So, they are syntactically distinct entities, but they are semantically equivalent from the laws of Boolean algebra. Okay. So, equivalence, so however, when we are worried about when we are talking about programs or expressions occurring within programs, we are really talking about syntactic entities and defining the meanings of syntactic entities in terms of other semantic objects. Your semantic objects could could reside in any area of mathematics for example. Yeah. So, what constitutes equality in mathematics is really a form of semantic equivalence. Yeah. And uh, so, this is this is a this is one clear example of. So, in most of mathematics, we are not really worried about syntax, we are worried about their semantical properties, and so uh, or what might be called model theoretic properties. I mean, the a mathematical discipline focuses on a certain class of objects, and we are looking for looking at truths with regard to that class of objects. And two statements in that in that area of mathematics are equivalent uh, if they denote really the same object in that class of objects that the mathematical discipline uh, is concerned with. Yeah. So in the case of Boolean expressions, uh, we have two distinct syntactical entities which denote the same object in all possible contexts and therefore, they are semantically equivalent. Yeah. So, so that is what we would consider expression equivalence and this is something uh, we should remember that we should uh, we should ensure that we follow these uh, I mean that our the eventual semantics that we give for a programming language follows at least these basic principles that you are able to derive equivalence not necessarily through a theorem prover, but at least by hand you are able to prove equivalence of expressions and that they do not anyway in any way distort uh, our uh, conventional notions of equ equality in mathematics and so on and so forth. However, you will see that they will actually a lot of programming languages because of their particular implementations do distort conventional mathematics. Yeah. So, however, for example, uh, there is many expressions in especially in imperative languages produce what are known as side effects. Yeah. So, what they do is that the expression of course, denotes a value, but along the way it alters the store. Okay. This is so what happens is that this uh, uh, a simple example of this is let us say a function in Pascal. So, a function in Pascal <coughs> might be called from some outer scope and if it is a function uh, call it should reside within an expression. Okay. So, you could for example, you could have some complicated expression involving let us say sin x. Okay. Now, if this function is declared by the user, it is quite likely that the user inside that function body has changed some global variable. So, even though at the at the place of call of the function it looks like an expression which just yields a value and nothing else and it makes no other changes actually because of the because of the fact that there is some assignment to some global variable inside the function body the store that is the location value bindings of the whole program are changed irreversibly okay and that is a is is a side effect that is produced by a function call. So, then what happens is that an expression uh, expression uh, so two distinct expressions may may yield the same value under all 
conditions, but they may produce different side effects on the global store. Okay. So, what it means is that we will have to we will have to change our ideas about what constitutes the equivalence of two expressions. Yeah, I will talk about an irreversible change, I will talk about reversible changes. So, his question was why am I calling this an irreversible change? So, I will I will talk about reversible changes and then maybe you will understand why it is why this particular change is irreversible. Yeah. So, so what so side effects can be produced by expressions especially in our in most in most imperative languages. A large part of for example, C relies entirely on side effects. Right. Uh, so, so, so then what we have to do is we have to refine the meaning of the word, uh, we have to refine the meaning of what constitutes an, the equivalence of two expressions. So, what we should what we can say is that two expressions are equivalent, if they yield, equ equ uh, if they yield equal values and they also produce identical side effects in all computation states right. So, uh, so this the side effects produced by expressions is uh, is a problem not in mathematics, but in computer science. It is also one of the one of the reasons why uh, debugging programs is itself a hard task in most programming languages is because you it is the side effects are very carefully hidden under different names, under different environment bindings, they are aliased and uh, all these things complicate matters for analyzing or debugging a program. Yeah. So, so expressions, uh, so that constitutes a large class of expressions in most programming languages. And the next syntactic category are what are known as commands, right. So, uh, here we are coming to uh, what uh, something like the question he asked. So, we would look upon a command as a change of as a request for a change of store and we are saying irreversible again. Okay. It is irreversible in the sense that unless that it is not guaranteed that that command can be undone. Okay. It is possible that two subsequent commands neutralize the effects of each other, okay, but it is not guaranteed that you can always do that. Okay. We would still look upon those two commands which neutralize the effects of each other, maybe which start with a certain store sigma, one command produces a new store sigma 1 and the other command produces, produces back sigma. We will just regard this as a sequence of two irreversible changes and that it is a mere accident that the last state sigma to, uh, sigma 2 is the same as the first state sigma. Yeah. And I will tell you what we will we'll look further when we when we come to the notion of an environment in detail you will see what exactly is reversible there, so that you understand what irreversible means here. So, we will look upon a command as something that is essentially going to change the store, change the state of a computation in some uh, in some permanent fashion. And permanent of course, is within quotes because it is permanent till the next command changes it further, right. So, um, on the other hand, if you take expressions without side effects, uh, they really do not produce any change at all in the, in the, in this, in the store of any computation, okay. They only yield a value expressions without side effects simply yield a value, they do not change a store. Okay. So, most of the commands you are familiar with are 
assignment commands, various kinds of control structures uh, in most of the imperative programming languages and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and it is clear that many of them involve, uh, most of them involve state changes. Of course, you could have something like a null command which does nothing, but that is just a degenerate case of a command that can change its state. Yeah? Uh, so, so, so the next question is when are two commands equivalent? So, we will say that two commands are semantically equivalent if for all input states they produce the same output state. So, a command is essentially a state to state transformation. It takes an input state as an argument and yields an output state at the end of its execution. Right. So, um, so here, he, so, so, so we would. So, for example, this is uh, this is something that's well known. That this command, which consists of an if-then construct with a while loop inside it, is semantically equivalent to this construct, which is just the while loop itself. Now, this this could have been obtained by an unfolding of this while loop. In some standard, uh, in some standard form, uh, notice that I'm here. B is a Boolean expression, uh, and this Boolean expression could actually produce side effects. Okay, if there is a function call inside this Boolean expression, it could produce side effects, but this is equivalent in the sense that even if B does produce side effects, the effect of one is exactly the same as the effect of the other under all computation states. That is important. Uh, being able to locally produce uh, any, the same kind of state changes is not the same as being able to assert that under all computation states they produce the same effects. Yeah. Okay. The last category are what are known as environments and uh, environments are created and changed by declarations. Okay. So, declarations constitute the last syntactic category and what they do is they change environments. They produce environment to environment transformations, sometimes they also produce changes in the store. So, in that, in that sense environments could be, so in, in that sense environments could be changed also in an irreversible fashion. But when we normally talk of environments, the changing of envi environments by new declarations, the changes are very often reversible in the sense that you create a change in the environment or you create a new environment when you enter a new scope. And when you exit that scope, you often revert back to the old environment. So, the change in the environment is reversible in that sense. However, the environment itself, the, the change in the environment could have been produced by some commands or some expressions with side effects which could have altered the store. But the change in the store that a declaration produces is irreversible. Yeah. So, the environment is reversible, the creation of a new environment is a reversible process and usually depends upon us, upon the normal scope rules of uh, programming language. I mean there are different kinds of scope rules you could have, but essentially the notion of a scope um, means that you could create a new environment temporarily and 
you could destroy that environment and revert back to your old environment after some time. Okay? In that sense, the change in environment produced by definitions or declarations is reversible. However, as I said, you could have expressions involving commands, commands involving expressions, expressions involving declarations, declarations involving expressions and commands and so on and so forth. So, declarations could also produce irreversible changes because they have underlying commands in them or they have underlying expressions in them which produce side effects. Right? So, they could produce irreversible changes, but if you look at declarations in a sort of a pure form as merely environment creating objects. This as uh, if you look at declarations merely as a syntactic representation for a temporary change in environment, then what declarations would produce are reversible changes and not irreversible changes. Yeah? So, uh, so in the in their pure form, we would look upon expressions that means without side effects as just they do not as, as syntactic representations of something which do not change the environment, which do not change the store, but which just yield a value. Commands in their pure or impure form always change the store. In their pure form, they do not create new environments. Declarations in their pure form just create new environments and do not change the store. But since all programming languages are recursively defined using these three kinds of classes, each of them could produce effects which are really impure in the sense that expressions could produce irreversible changes, declarations could produce irreversible changes in store and uh, commands could produce new temporary changes in the environment. Yeah, this is th that typically happens when you have a procedure call. A procedure call is itself a command, but a procedure call often means the creation of a new environment with new localized bindings, associations of new names or new bindings for names already used temporarily created for the purpose of that procedure call. Yeah? Right. So, you, <coughs> you said that expressions, commands and declar declarations do not overlap, so we can always express one in terms of other, what is meant by that? You said we can define one syntactic class in terms of other. No, uh, what I meant was that conceptually they do not overlap, but if you look at the syntactic definition of a programming language, let, let's take a, let's take the following constant declaration in Pascal, right? So I have I have this. Let's say m equals ten. The effect of this is to create a new environment in which there is a binding for the name m and that binding is the value 10. There might be an old n, old m somewhere else, but the effect of this declaration is to create a new environment. Okay? I could also have something like this. Okay? So, here is a declaration of two new uh, not too new of two names m and n with fresh value bindings okay and the only way i can produce the value binding is by using an expression okay right i could if you were to look at some function declaration in pascal so what you might have 
is something of this form a function fun let's say with some parameters uh, which do not really matter with some let us say it returns an integer. This function declaration also has a function body which is a command. Okay. The only way I can define new functions in Pascal for example, is by using the language of expressions and commands to their fullest extent. Okay. Right. So, here, here is a case of a function which will use both the expression language and the command language in order to produce essentially what constitutes a value. Supposing this is a pure function in the sense that it produces no side effects on the global store, then what you would have are these let us say only value parameters. If you had reference parameters, they would produce, they, 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 were, they are likely to produce side effects. So, let us say just value parameters, you would have maybe some local variables and the entire command C would just involve these parameters and these local variables and finally, there would be some assignment to the name fun which is the value. Okay. But the point is that I cannot define new functions unless I use the command language and the expression language. Okay. Now, uh, so, you, so you, ca you can have uh, declarations which use expressions and commands. You can have expressions like an expression involving fun which uses commands, which uses a declaration. You could have, a, uh, you could have commands which just use declarations. For example, uh, many languages allow you uh, back from the days of algol 60 to define a local command an unnamed function locally or an unnamed procedure locally with just local declarations. So, this is not allowed in Pascal of course, but uh, so for, for example, algol 60 typically allows something like this. I can have a begin a set of declarations and some command locally as part of some larger program. Okay. There is no name nothing, but there is there are some local declarations. So, and this whole thing is a command which requires a new environment to be created by these declarations and this command insi inside it would in, in turn involve expressions. Okay. So, commands might involve expressions and declarations, declarations might involve expressions and commands and expressions might involve declarations and commands. I mean, the, 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 the definition of, so uh, one of the principles in, in uh, programming language design is that you can actually add syntactic sugar to one syntactic class to produce another syntactic class. Okay. You can add purely cosmetic reserved words or keywords which, which transform a declaration into a command, a command into an expression, an expression into a declaration, an expression into a command and so on and so forth. They are all mutually interchangeable, but the meaning that is intended should be clear. If, if, it's a, if you are adding an expression, if you are adding something to an expression to make it a declaration, then it is clear that your idea is to create a temporary change in environment. Right? I mean what constitutes an expression in this, uh, in this declaration is not the same as what constitutes an expression inside here in the sense that the intention of this declaration is to produce a new environment. The intention of a command is to change state. For convenience, you might require to, just because that command becomes too complicated to simplify it, you might require the, the introduction of more new names just which are just local to that command as in the case of unnamed blocks in algo 60. 
okay. But the intention of this is very clear, the intention of this is to modify the store, is to produce an irreversible change in the store. Yeah. Yeah. So, so declarations really denote new environments, they may also change the stir and we would say that two declarations are equivalent provided they produce identical environments in all computation states and they produce equivalent stores. A declaration could change, could produce irreversible changes as in the case of a function declaration or a procedure declaration. Yeah. So, when we look at commands, this, this is something we have not seen in, uh, this is not something we earlier specified. We would say equivalent commands yield identical changes in store in all computational change, in, in all computational states. However, two different commands could, pr could be equivalent even though the temporary changes in environment they produce are different. Right? So, in between inside the command you could have some declarations and the declarations in the two commands might produce different new environments. But declarations for example, are essentially an uh, creation of reversible changes in the environment at the end of that at the end of the two commands you should have the same environment and store in both cases. So, you start at a with a computational state and the resulting output state of the computation should be identical in the two regardless of what are the intermediate how different are the intermediate changes produced in the computational state. Yeah. So, what distinguishes between uh, what are known as functional or applicative languages and what are known as imperative languages are that imperative languages contain all three syntactic classes whereas functional languages contain only the language of only the two syntactic categories expressions and declarations. Okay. So, the concept of a store, the concept of side effects is absent in functional languages. So, we will look at that in some greater detail later.